Today, I'm happy to speak about what's new in 2015 regarding chronic disease mineral bone disorders. This was my presentation during the activities of the fifth annual conference of Tanto and Fergionet last uh, Tuesday. So I categorized my presentation in different sectors. One of these sectors is the endocrine function. Bone is not inert. It is very active, secrete a lot of hormones. And here, the, one of the key hormones secreted by bone, osteocytes, is the FGF23, which was known previously as phosphatonin because it stimulates phosphatic secretion by kidney. So with advancement of chronic kidney disease, FGF23 is stimulated to allow the kidney to secrete phosphorus. But with advancement of chronic kidney disease, the, the resistance for its action develop. So uh, it acts on the kidney by combining the co-receptor clotho. But a lot of actions uh, FGF23 exert. On heart, it di acts directly, leading to lifting into a hypertrophy without the need for clotho. And it has a lot of actions. Sclerosetin, another hormone secreted by bone, also has a bad effect on the, on the vessels. This uh, cartoon summarizes the interplay between phosphorus, Barathormone, FGF23, and vitamin D. It is very important because the current drugs that treat the smell you depends on this relationship. So phosphate is the key player. It stimulates uh, FGF23, stimulates barathormone as well, because both of barathormone and the FGF23 act on kidney, stimulating the excretion of phosphorus. So phosphorus stimulate the release of FGF23, stimulate the release of beta-H. Beta-H and the FGF23 decreases serum phosphorus through increasing filtration fraction of phosphorus. Beta-H stimulate FGF23, FGF23 inhibit beta-H. The action of vitamin D, vitamin D stimulate FGF23 release and it's inhibited by FGF23. Barath hormone stimulate uh, vitamin D activation and vi active vitamin D inhibit barath hormone. So the treatment of hyperparathyroidism or the CKD mineral bonus orders depends upon uh, take care of phosphorus by regulating the diet using phosphate binders, inhibiting the beta H and F3 using the wise use of vitamin D uh, on the early phases. This one of the nice and recent reviews showing the actions and function of FGF23. If you look, the atrophosphate, if, if there is imbalance in the atrophosphate, it uh, leads to increasing phosphorus load that stimulate FGF23. FGF23 is associated and linked with heart failure because it stimulates the hypertrophy, increases left into hypertrophy. And also, uh, it is one of the risk factors for atrial fibrillation. Its correlation with coronary heart disease exists, but it's not strong like heart failure because it mainly lead to, leads to hypertrophy. Regarding clotho, clotho is mainly secreted by kidney. It is present on the kidney as full lens on the membrane of the, of the renal tubules. And it, uh, hydrolysis of this full lens led to secretory part. And secretory part has hormonal action. Its function, the function of clotho, is to preserve life. It's anti-aging process. Uh, this study showed that the, in comparison to healthy persons, the more the advancement of the chronic kidney stages, the lower the level of serum alpha clotho. So the advancement of chronic kidney disease, clotho decreases. Very exciting study correlating colossal deficiencies with uremic toxin. So there is a inverse relationship between uremic toxin and endoxyl sulfate, which is produced by the colon. So endoxyl sulfate increases and the colossal decreases. And this is a linear inverse relationship. And this is a, a showed if the colossal decreases, the heart muscle mass increases. So colossal deficiency increases left ventricular mass and the mass index and is correlated with endoxyl sulfate. In animal model, if you look, injection, intraperitoneal injection of cloth of uh, endoxyl sulfate led to repression of clotho here by plot assay. 
and increasing collagen deposition and fibrosis of the kidney. And on the heart, if you look here in comparison to wild type of rats, the, uh, the use of endoxide sulfate increases lift of hypertrophy. If uh, the endoxide sulfate is added to environment of rat with deficiency of clotho, the uh, hypertrophy increases more and more. And this is if you combine if you combine endoxide sulfate and clotho deficiency, hypertrophy increases, as I mentioned. Here, this is the experiment. Uh, this is a sham group in coronary kidney disease. The heart weight increases because colostro is reduced uh, and inoxal sulfate increase. If you give colostro uh, to the rats, this, this is associated with ameliorations and decrease of left ventricular hypertrophy. And so this uh, led to the auditorial comments on this uh, paper to state that loss of colostro in coronary kidney disease breaks one's heart. So every day, hormonal function of the kidney increases and the protein. So in, uh, in the past, when we are asked, were asked uh, what are the endocrine function of the kidney, uh, the answer was hormones secreted by kidney, hormones acts on kidney, hormone increases with the advanced renal failure. Today, I added the value of uh, clotho because clotho is produced by the kidney. Regarding osteoporosis in coronary kidney disease, one of important issues, and this is one of the current uh, papers, still in press, showing the current approach for treatment of osteoporosis in general. As you see, the uh, axis of management depends upon two pathways. I have osteoblast and osteoclast, so either to suppress the osteoclastic activity, which is known as anti resorptive medications, or to stimulate the anabolic effect on the osteoblast by the uh, teriparatide. And here, the, uh, uh, this slide summarizes the action of spine for each drug, hip, and non-vertebral uh, parts. And here, the route of administration. This drug is given oral weekly. And this drug, intravenous annually, which is zeradronic acid. And denizumab is given every six months. So I show the mechanistic, the site of action in this cartoon. If you look, uh, we have osteoblast and we have osteoclast. Always in a normal situation, there is a balance between osteoblast and osteoclast. We don't want overactivity of osteoblast, otherwise we will have osteopetrosis. And we don't ha like the overactivity of osteoclast because it will lead to osteoporosis and subsequently fracture. So these are the drugs that works on the post pathways to help the management of osteoporosis. In osteoporosis, I want to suppress osteoclast, so bisosinate is there. But be careful whenever you use bisphosphonate in coronary kidney disease because it is not welcomed and cautiously used if SMG GFR less than 30 milli per minute. And even with normal GFR limits, limit the use of this class of drug to three years because the, of the many reports of the osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is associate, associating with the use of bisphosphonate and a typical fracture in this situation. Uh, a very important uh, drug, which uh, this is Rankel, secreted by osteocytes. What's Rankel? It is a receptor of activated nuclear kappa uh, B. This uh, acts on a rank, this is Rankel, act on rank. So it binds to rank on osteoclast. When Rankel binds to rank on osteoclast, osteoclast becomes activated. So denizumab, which blocks this binding, because it binds rankle, so it prevents rankle bind to rankle osteoclast, and this is the mechanism of action of denizumab. Uh, here, the another another drugs which I'll mention in coming slide, odanacetib, which works on capsaicin K. Capsaicin K is one of the collagen. Uh, it is proteolytic for collagen, so the great collagen increases the process. So if you inhibit the capsaicin K. It is of value in management of osteoporosis. I'll mention in the next slide. Sclerocetin inhibits the osteoblast. So if I inhibit osteosclerocetin uh, by certain drugs, it will be beneficial. The use of um, uh, terebratide stimulates the osteoblast. It, it, it is effective here. So a lot of drugs every day are added to the armamentarium against the osteoporosis. This one of the drugs, cathepsin, cathepsin K inhibitor, which is sustained release tablets, and this is from Japanese experience. If you look here, this placebo, 
100 milligram and 300 milligrams of stained release capsaicin inhibitor if you look here um, here uh, after 10 days or more the, the, the mean of 10 days we find the, the uh, larger the dose of capsaicin inhibitor the lower the C terminal telopeptide of type 1 collagen which is a marker of collagen degradation so it's very important that we are waiting further studies and the, this was a study on a postmenopausal women but we are waiting the testing of this drug in chronic kidney disease regarding the interactions of chronic kidney disease mineral bone disorder or renal transplantation we have a lot of publication this is one of the nice publications showed that after transplantation intimate medial thickness improves significantly and if you look at the different variables in this univariate and multivariate you'll find serum phosphorus is significantly reduced after transplantation and one of the key player uh, that in uh, improves the uh, intimate medial thickness if there is a link between the basal barath hormone and the graft outcome in the last uh, last publications from the um, data registry showed that if you transplant a patient with hyperpressure or this the outcome is reduced here this is the school trial barath hormone was estimated and measured after approximately five years of transplantation and then the patients were followed up for further six years or something like that and here they categorize the basal beta h if it's below 65 picogram per ml or above if beta h is above 65 the outcome here the mortality increases with the patients and graph survival decreases because this is a survival if the beta h is less than and if the if the pH is higher so the uh, this is graft loss the graft loss increases in the red color denote pH above 65 so graft loss increases whenever pH increases so pH high parathyroid the presence of hyperparathyroidism in the basal state and the basal state here was five years after transplantation the higher the pH the lower the graft outcome survival and patient so we should strive to monitor patients and to adjust the electrolytes calcium phosphorus pH and this may be of help regarding calcification calcification in chronic disease we have how many types of calcification we have in chronic kidney disease we have four this is the valve calcification the intima calcification the, this is the aorta showing the uh, calcified, calcified atheromas and we may have breast artery calcification denoting the media so the media of the vessel is calcified it increases after load and lead to uh, vascular disease and here this uh, correlation between the calcification and the occurrence of brief artery disease the more the calcification in breast artery in mammogram detected by mammogram the more the medial calcification the uh, more the peripheral artery disease especially in diabetic the first type we mentioned the valve calcification, intimal calcification, medial calcification, and lastly here, this is calciflexis in simultaneous liver kidney transplantation. And here we are stressing on monitoring the patients as one unit. The vascular calcification and the bone mineral density and disease relations with recurrent kidney stone former. The study shows that if you look at this uh, carton, you'll find the aorta, abdominal aorta calcification score increases if the patient is. Uh, within the recurrent stone formers and the mineral bond density decreases so uh, vascular calcification lower bone mineral density and the abdominal aortic calcifications are linked together with a certain environment this is a vascular calcification follow up after three years in non dialysis patient using a different uh, uh, parameter different investigation this is brain x-ray for the spine pelvis and hands and hands if you look here the and this is just showing that the hyperphosphatemia is linked with the problems and the mortality with vascular calcification regarding vitamin d uh, vitamin d it's very crucial and one of the most important management in the domain of chronic kidneys however we should be cautious whenever we prescribe vitamin d we should be first check we should first check uh, calcium phosphorus because it is not welcomed at all and no, we shouldn't give vitamin D therapy except after controlling phosphorus and it is, should be avoided in patients with hypercalcemia this study showed there's no 
impact of any vitamin D or analyzer in the survival in this meta-analysis. However, the earlier the treatment, the better the outcome. This one of the studies that showed that the in chronic kidney disease we may have not only deficiency of active vitamin D because of deficiency of one alpha hydroxylase by renal tubule in the and this is axiomatic in chronic kidney disease, but also the native vitamin D, either ergo calciferol or cholecalciferol vitamin D2 or D3. So this is a study showed that nutritional vitamin D supplementation by oral supplementation of vitamin D, and this is the Alice infection vitamin D in New England study. It is a randomized study showed that the usage of uh, either uh, high do uh, the weekly doses or monthly doses of 50,000 units of oral uh, ergocalciferol improves and significantly vitamin D level. This is the on a monthly and this is a weekly basis. But the question, was well, this uh, supplementation associated with uh, side effects, if you look here, the side effect profile, no difference at all between the placebo or uh, weekly or monthly dose. So this monthly, weekly, or placebo dose. So nutritional supplementation of vitamin D restore vitamin D level. So we can give this uh, the study, 50% of patients receive as well active vitamin D. So we can give active vitamin D and native vitamin D for patients with chronic kidney disease. Phosphorus is a very important, still key player, is linked with morbidity and mortality. Here, this is one of the study meta-analysis for cohort, 12 cohort studies included. 25,000 patients uh, showed that for each rise of phosphorus, one milligram per deciliter rise of phosphorus has a risk for renal failure increases by 36%. And mortality by 20%. So we should be careful about management of phosphorus. One of the very nice articles that showed the uh, how we improve the health education of the patients, and this was reflected on the control of phosphorus. This is Italian phos phosphorus pyramid. If you look, we have multiple color. The green color is uh, friend. The uh, deep red color is foo. So we should educate the patient the early phases of chronic is to take freely the bottom level of this uh, pyramid and all through the chronic is we should avoid the top one coca-cola or food additives the this pyramid is based upon two uh, knowledges two facts in chronic is and even in the Alice patient we don't at all recommend with uh, the uh, for, uh, protein restriction because if we recommend protein for the general population 0.8 gram per kg per day for dialysis patients we need more 1.2 gram per kg per day because dialysis is a catabolic process but because the many diets that include protein have uh, have phosphorus so the uh, the idea of pyramid depends on the ratio of phosphorus to protein so we, the cutoff point is 12 milligram protein per gram, uh, 12 milligram phosphorus per gram protein. So foods with uh, phosphorus less than 12 milligram per one gram protein are uh, appreciated, and above that, it's high phosphorus content. The second point, the source of phosphorus. We have plant source, animal or uh, uh, organic source, and inorganic source. Plants, the absorption of plant sort, phosphorus from plant source is limited because it, the phosphorus is bound to phytate and we don't have enzyme for phytate destruction. So the bioavailability, this means the fraction of phosphorus absorbed from the plant is approximately 30%. But bioavailability from organic source, which is present in animal and fish and dairy products, is 70%, 6 to 70%. And we need them. So we can eat them, provided that we uh, look at the phosphorus protein ratio, if, uh, uh, and this will help. In organic phosphorus, there is no value for an organic phosphorus because an organic pho phosphorus is present in the food additives, processing of foods, and Coca-Cola. So we should avoid them at all in chronic kidney disease patients. Will will help. The second and important knowledge is boiling. If you boil the foods, either plant or animal, you decrease the phosphorus content. But be careful. If we boil the food, we should omit water. We shouldn't drink the. We should 
consume the water with the food. So, so we should emit them, and this is very important uh, advice. So the phosphorus pyramid is a visual tool for dietary phosphate management in dialysis and the chronic kidney patients. A very nice, and it, uh, I was anxious when I read this article, a dearth of data, dearth means a paucity of data, the problem of phosphorus in prescribing medications. So we have two hidden sources for phosphorus, dietary phosphorus, and I mentioned the phosphate protein ratio and food additives. And here, another an important item that uh, this was very interesting study in New Jersey. They reviewed all medication used in dialysis domain and they found them 200 drugs. And then they reviewed the drug label and they didn't find the phosphorus except in 11%. Uh, so they uh, assessed phosphorus content in different, in different drugs. If you look here, if you have amlodipine, which is antihypertensive drug, 10 milligram amlodipine from this company, the phosphorus content in uh, each tablet is 8.6 milligram. And in this uh, uh, company, 27, and this is 40 milligram. So 40, to remove 40 milligram, you should use one gram of uh, phosphate binder uh, carbonate or, or whatever the phosphate binder you use. Lysinopril, 10 milligram tablet from the Merck, 21 milligram from Blueprint, 32 milligram. And the surprise is a baroxetine, which is antidepressant, 40 milligram. From this, uh, this is one of the generic uh, companies, 22 milligram uh, phosphorus, but in the original drug by Glaxo, Smith and Klein, it is 111 milligrams, so it is quite, quite big dose of phosphorus, and we don't know. We don't know, so we should be careful. And this is this. The article was published, and they put this example: if you uh, you if you treat your patient to, with one amlodipine tablet from the Green Stones and one for, uh, lisinopril from the Blueprint and the one tonic tablet from Renavit, this constitutes 110 milligram, and you need four four uh, grams of calcium carbonate to remove this excess phosphate intake by the, and hidden in these drugs. And this paper um, uh, calls the company, the governments and the non-governmental organization to press on the drug companies and the factories to put the label, including phosphorus. Regarding phosphate binders and new drugs, ferroxytrates, phosphate binders, the study showed the, uh, this is a randomized study, including, included more than 400 patients. If you look, the use of new uh, ferroxytrate phosphate binders uh, was associated with a reduced uh, need for iron. All these are no need for iron here and there. If you compare with the control, you find here the ferric citrate uh, preserve and uh, decreases the need for iron. So no iron, low dose of iron, moderate dose and high dose. So this one of advantage. It, it is effective in reducing phosphate and as well as reduce the need for iron and for ESA therapy. The no ESA therapy is small dose, moderate dose, high dose. In comparison to control, again, the use of ferroxytrate reduces the need for iron and ESA therapy. The kidney good line should be reviewed and well, uh, should be re reviewed, reviewed, and this is one of the article calling for revisiting kidney guidelines and we are waiting the refinement of guidelines to answer many questions. And uh, this is the last slide of my presentation. And this is uh, Dr. Dua Hamid, one of, um, dietitian, one of the active dietitian in Egypt. She is a consultant of nutrition. And um, uh, she uh, uh, invented this Egyptian phosphorus map in Arabic uh, with certain foods. This is different triangle. The base of the triangle the contents of phosphorus in the basal triangle is uh, lower than the apex. So again, the same color uh, map. Uh, this is uh, good and this is bad. So the apex, are, we don't recommend and advise not to cons for uh, patients on dialysis to avoid the any foods in the apex. And this uh, this map is currently in evolutions and will be available within a week or two uh, in the patient's education. And in comparison to the Italian pyramid, it is, Italian pyramid is very simple. However, it is the, our Egyptian phosphorus map is more accurate because here uh, you, you should explain everything, every row, but here 
every, every type of food is explained just by a single look. At the end of the presentation, I uh, appreciated the presence of Professor Ahmed Halawa. He is a consultant transplant surgeon at Sheffield University because uh, he delivered and he trained uh, enthusiastically and honestly all the surgeons in different areas in Egypt. Today in Tanta, uh, couple, uh, one week uh, ago was in the uh, uh, Munufaya, previously Mansoura, and uh, he is going everywhere in the country to educate the surgeon and this is a volunteer with no money. And this is, um, I, I, I reviewed all quotations to describe uh, Dr. Halal. I find this quotation, friend, is like a book that has to be read to appreciate its beauty. As such, Dr. Ahmed Halawa is one of the finest books ever written. And we asked if we could do a reprint from uh, Dr. Ahmed Halawa. And the next visit of Dr. Ahmed Halawa will be, will be in the uh, Bursaid General Hospital to train surgeon there for parasitotomy. And thank you for attention.